thank you very much for coming out tonight and hopefully in the next 30 to 35 minutes I can give you some information that you'll be able to take away that will help you in making uh, healthy decisions around eating, physical activity and sedentary behaviour. If we just look first of all at the prevalence or the proportion of people in Australia who are overweight or obese, it's around 60% for adults. And for quite a number of years now, males are about 10 percentage points higher than females. Does that surprise you? Okay. So around 60% of adults are overweight or obese. When it comes to kids, it's a little bit different in terms of how we have to measure it. For adults, it's very easy. We just have to pick a BMI of 25, and if you're above that, you're overweight. And you work out your BMI by taking your weight in kilograms and dividing it by your height in metres squared. So you'll end up with a, a, a value which is called your BMI or body mass index. If it's over 25, you're considered overweight, and if it's over 30, you're considered obese. Doesn't matter what age you are over 18, whether you're male or female, those are the same values. When it comes to kids, because they're growing, it's a little bit different. So what we have to do is we have to have values that are appropriate for the age and gender of the child. And these are values here, this is, they, these go from age 2 all the way up to age 18, that are used to define overweight or obesity in children and adolescents. And essentially it's taking a value of uh, 25 for overweight and 30 for obese for adults and extrapolating what that would be at particular ages using mathematical modelling. So that's how we determine, so if you're a 5 year old boy, and your BMI is above 17.4, you would be considered overweight. And if you're above 19.3, you would be considered obese. So, as we pointed out before, around one in four kids in Australia are either overweight or obese. Now, what's interesting about this is that it had stayed relatively consistent since about 2004. So this is data that's been collected in New South Wales through schools on school-aged children and adolescents. And you can see we started collecting data in New South Wales back in the mid-80s. Before that, there was some data from South Australia, and I've put that there to show that really from the period 1985 prior, there hadn't really been any market shifts in the prevalence of overweight and obesity among our kids. It stayed around 10%. But something happened between 1985 and 1997 that caused a significant increase in the prevalence of both overweight and obesity. So back from about the mid-1980s and around that time, the prevalence of overweight has around about doubled and the prevalence of obesity has quadrupled in that time. So as I said before, it's around one in four. Some variations according to cultural background and socioeconomic status where those from non-English backgrounds and those from a lower socioeconomic status have a slightly higher prevalence, but nonetheless around one in four or 25% which makes it one of the um, most common public health crises facing our children today. Now, why is it a problem? Well, there has been good evidence collected over a number of years that children who are overweight or obese suffer from a range of adverse health consequences. Now, these adverse health consequences occur whilst they are a child and they also can occur when they become adults. So they can stay with them for a period of time. Now, some of these that are most alarming occur in the psychosocial area. So overweight kids are bullied more, they're teased more, they have more difficulty making friends, and they suffer from poor self-esteem, depression, higher rates of depression, and what might seem contradictory, they also have a higher prevalence of eating disorders. They have problems with their sleep, poorer quality sleep, which has a whole range of other health outcomes. They find it difficult to be active, this disease here, which is also called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, is similar to what you would see in someone who has cirrhosis of the liver, and it can occur also um, more frequently in overweight and obese kids, which can predispose them to liver, liver dysfunction, um, liver transplants down the track. So what are or what have been some of the changes that have occurred in the last 35 years. I'm just going to spend a little bit of time covering this and then go on to some changes or some strategies based on research, both our own and others, for ways in which we can promote physical activity, eat healthier and hopefully prevent unhealthy weight gain. Now, soft drinks have increased in their prevalence and in their availability over the last 
30 years. And this is a study that was done some time ago, but nonetheless, it does demonstrate just how available these drinks are compared with healthier drinks such as milk and water. So there's been a 300% increase in the consumption of sweetened beverages, and this is soft drinks, um, sports drinks, flavoured teas over this period of time. Bill Clinton has an initiative and one of the aspects of his initiative is child obesity and he focused in that initiative on removing vending machines in schools that sell full sugar or non-diet soft drinks. And he's been able to have these reduced or around 90% of, of those that were in schools, not in schools anymore. Uh, th this I think is a problem because soft drinks are what we call empty calories. So they contain a high number of calories or kilojoules, however when you consume them, you don't feel full afterwards. Or if they do fill up your tummy, you do get hungry again quite quickly afterwards. So it's, it's what we consider empty calories. And there's quite a bit of sugar. The soft drink that has the most sugar is not Coca-Cola, but it's Mountain Dew. So a buddy of Mountain Dew, 600 mils, contains 19 and a half teaspoons of sugar. So you can see it's very easy to overconsume or to take in more energy by drinking soft drink on a regular basis. In terms of physical activity, what do we know about changes that have occurred within our environment over this same time period? Well, if we look at organised sports, they haven't changed. In fact, if anything, they've gone up slightly. So there are still many kids participating in organised sports, which is one form in which we can be physically active. When we look at what's happened in a school environment, also, there haven't been considerable changes in physical education, recess and lunch are still there, school sport over that time. We don't have data to show what, if there have been changes in terms of how active kids are in those time periods, but we do know from the fact that these um, opportunities are still available that there haven't also been changes that could explain why kids are moving less. So what has changed? Far fewer kids are walking or cycling to school, or taking active modes to get to, to get to and from school. So this has gone down significantly. That was one opportunity that kids had to be physically active. And particularly among primary school kids, that has decreased significantly for a whole range of reasons. But the one in which we think is mostly responsible is a decrease in what we call incidental or discretionary activity. It's that sort of activity that you don't really remember what you were doing or how long you were doing it for, but you were active. So it was a lot of this sort of stuff that would happen in neighbourhoods, particularly in after-school periods and on weekends. You know, the idea that you'd be out there doing something, you'd come home, your mum would say, where have you been? Nowhere. What have you done? Nothing. You sort of did a whole lot of nothing and you went nowhere, but you were probably active when you were doing it. So this has been where we think there have been the most changes in our environment. Now, it's hard to actually quantify how much because whilst we can measure incidental activity now, we couldn't measure it 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago very accurately because people just couldn't remember incidental activity. They could remember sports but they can't remember this type of activity. But we do know that there have been some changes that would have resulted in a decrease in incidental activity. And some of these are that parents have told us that they perceive the neighbourhood to be less safe than what it was 20 years ago. Now, in reality, the neighbourhoods are not less safe, but parental perceptions tell them that it is less safe. And perceptions are what drives behaviour more so than actual risk in a lot of these cases. So neighbourhoods being less safe. More traffic on the road. So again, the neighbourhood is less safe because there's more cars on the road. It's not a safer place to play in the suburb. And there are more competing demands on kids' leisure time. Whereas before, there was nothing to do inside. So you went outside and played. Nowadays, there are many devices within the home that are tempting kids to stay inside and often to sit down compared with going outside and being active. To the point where kids now are failing to recognise objects that perhaps at one stage 
were used for physical activity and confusing them with devices that might be used with technology. Finally, the size of our backyard has also decreased significantly. So we do have some data on this. So the, the homes that we are currently building take up a much bigger footprint on our blocks of land. So this is my backyard when I was growing up. Anyone recognise that? The hill's hoist that took up a prominent spot in the backyard and there was lots of space to run around if you couldn't play in the neighbourhood. Uh, this is our backyard and even over a period of time, uh, as, as people extend, as we've done, as our, our, our backyard sort of comes up, our house actually ends there now. So our backyard has got considerably smaller over time too, as have a lot of backyards. So if it's not safe to play in the neighbourhood because of a whole range of reasons, where is it safe to play? In the backyard. But if the backyard is small and it's not an inviting place to play and there are many things tempting us to stay inside, then it's going to become much more difficult to expend more energy or to move more. I've outlined the problem and I don't want to leave it there because it's all been negative so far, but do we have any evidence that we can make a change, that we can actually prevent unhealthy weight gain by implementing some simple strategies that we've been shown have been effective, particularly within family environments? And I'm just going to focus tonight on things that can hopefully be done on an individual level and within a family context. There are other responsibilities that need to be taken up by government, by policy makers, but I'm not going to cover those tonight. So firstly, I'm going to look at six key dietary messages that can help you to consume less energy. So that's what we're about if we're trying to prevent unhealthy weight gain. A bottom line is trying to consume less energy or kilojoules in our diet. And the first thing is to try and drink more water. So if water is your preferred drink, particularly if you switch from soft drinks or sugar-sweetened beverages, you'll reduce your kilojoules considerably. Now, we're talking here about water, not adding anything to the water, such as cordial or juice. Okay, we're talking here about plain water or, in the case of children, low-fat milk would be another preferred drink as well. Now, if soft drinks are in the house, the same with probably any unhealthy food, then there is a greater chance that it will be consumed. If it's not in the house, then it's less of a temptation. Okay, so simply by not having that food in the house will help with not consuming it. Trying to consume more fruit and vegetables, so two servings of fruit, five servings of vegetables, is another way in which you can reduce energy content and also at the same time increase um, your consumption of healthy foods that um, are good for you for a whole range of other reasons. Some ways or some strategies that, that we've found have been effective are to try and offer vegetables in as many different ways as possible, whether it be baked, whether it be dried vegetables, whether it be grating them up within a bolognese, whether it be raw vegetables, having them there on the bench where children can nibble at them, um, is also something that can increase consumption. Um, trying to look at recipes that you commonly have in which you might put a lot of meat, and we're thinking here about um, spaghetti bolognese, lasagna, and seeing if you can substitute some of the meat in that recipe for vegetables. So you still have the meat there, um, but also see if you can um, hide vegetables within that as well. And there are ways that you can do that with, um, with some common recipes. Uh, again... Having plenty available in the house, having a fruit bowl that's always full, having fruit that's, um, that, that's widely available is another way that you can increase consumption of these. And we often say the message to the parents that it's a shared responsibility here. So the advice we give parents is that parents provide, so parents decide what is eaten at mealtimes, they decide when it's eaten, but the kids decide whether they eat it or not. So it's a shared responsibility there. And don't give up if your children don't like it the first time. We have one child that uh, we've probably served broccoli over 200 times to, and he still doesn't eat it. But we're still trying, and maybe one day we'll get there. But, yes, be persistent with this. You know, sometimes parents will say, oh, look, I offered it to them once and they didn't like it. Well, you've just got to keep offering it. And over time, you will find that they will start 
to eat it. Their, 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 um, their tastes change over time. And, but don't, don't make the meal times, you know, something where, where there is a lot of conflict. So parents provide, kids decide. Switching to low-fat dairy is another easy thing that you can do. So low-fat milk, low-fat cheese, low-fat yoghurt are all things that you can switch from if you're consuming full cream or full fat dairy. And healthy snacks as well. Now, all foods have a nutrition label. And when you look at that label, it looks something like this. You've got one column that has per serving and one that has per 100 grams. Now, what you're looking for for a healthy snack are three things. And we call it the 510-3 rule. You're looking for the energy per serve to be less than 500. So if you have a muesli bar, that's usually one serve. Pay very careful attention when you look at a food to see how big a serving size is. Because sometimes if you've got two Tim Tams in a packet, the serving size might be one of those Tim Tams, not both of them that are in the packet. So if less than 500 kilojoules per serve, and then less than 10 grams of total fat per 100 grams, and less than 3 grams of saturated fat per 100 grams. So less than 500 kilojoules per serve, less than 10 grams of total fat per 100, and less than 3 grams of saturated fat. Try and use that when you go to the supermarket and you're navigating the muesli bar aisle and trying to determine which one is healthy here. And this is another app that um, has been developed, and thanks to my son Sam for putting this slide in and teaching me about this app. So this is an app called Food Switch, which is free. And essentially, if you've got it on a mobile device, you take a photo of the barcode of an item and it will come up like this. So we'll use thumbnails, so green being good, orange being okay, and then red being not good. So it will then tell you, and if you click on the plus button, it will expand that to show you how much of each of those um, uh, nutrients are in the food. And if there is a healthier option, it will also provide that for you. Okay, so again, that's a healthy app to look at when you're in the supermarket and you're not quite sure about some foods and whether they're healthy or not. Um, try not to skip breakfast. It's the most important meal of the day. And if you are someone that doesn't like to eat of a morning or finds it hard to get going of a morning, here are some tips that can help you with at least trying to get something in your stomach before you go off for the day. Because it's been shown that if you don't eat breakfast, your energy levels stay low, your metabolism stays lower, which means you're not burning off as much energy, and there's a greater chance that you'll consume unhealthy foods and you'll consume an unhealthier diet throughout the day. So breakfast is really important. If you find it hard and you like to sleep in, then do more the night before so that you're better organised in the morning. Okay, so you're not in such a rush that you miss out on having breakfast. If you don't feel like eating, then having something to kick your metabolism over can be a good thing. So a small glass of juice, if you don't feel like eating straight away, can help you to feel like eating something a short period of time afterwards. Now, if you again don't have time, then at least trying to pack something so that you can eat something, whether it be on the run can also help with putting something in your stomach and um, increasing your metabolism um, early on in the day, which is important in terms of keeping it up. So just in closing, we do live in an environment which makes it very difficult and challenging for us to eat less and to move more. But hopefully there are some things that you can walk away with tonight that will be helpful for you. And it's really important, I think, for the health of our children that we do make some changes, that we do take seriously the health consequences and the risks associated with child obesity, and that we do all that we can to be able to make our environment as healthy as possible for our kids. I'd just like to finish by thanking all the researchers and uh, research students who have been part of the research that we've been conducting at the university uh, over a number of years, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions if people have those now. Thank you. I was just wondering, like I've stopped my child having a lot of things, and now he says, when are you going to let me have a soft drink? When are you going to let me go to Macca's? And so it's more or less this thing out of his reach that he really yearns for. Yet when we go there, he says, oh, Mum, I don't like anything here. But, I, like, it's a catch-22. Like, do you have to let them have some for the psyche? psychological value? Oh, look, I think there, there, there has been evidence to show that regular consumption of fast food is associated with unhealthy weight gain. 
and that's because you consume, if you consume fast food regularly, and regularly they've defined as four times a week or more, so it's quite high. Um, I think when you look at food, it, it's, it, the, 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 the adage, the you know, balance and moderation rings true. But it's interesting when you look at your diet, just how, where you think there might be a lot of balance, how easy it is to actually consume unhealthy foods. But certainly, I'm, I'm not advocating that you, you know, that you stop consuming certain foods because often for that reason that you've mentioned, it's more about how you can have it in balance or have it in moderation. And, um, you know, what, what's a healthy consumption of fast food? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know if there's been, you know, certainly advice around that, but certainly when you talk to, to, um, to families that have made changes and families that, um, that, that, that have um, had o overweight children and, and are looking at making changes, um, they seem to suggest that, you know, somewhere still around every two or three weeks is, is something that, um, you know, it, it seems to address that, that concern that you've got. Hi, just a, a quick question from the early childhood field. Um, in the past, there's been programs that have been introduced to service such as Munch and Move, Get Up and Grow, etc., to try and increase um, physical activity and decrease the sedentary activities. Um, what sort of would you, advice would you give services that they start with a lot of gusto with these programs, but then they seem to be forgotten and physical activity doesn't seem to be a high priority, whereas meeting government regulations and national standards seem to override those? What sort of innovative ideas would you suggest to keep that momentum going forward? Mm. That's a really good question. So, and we see the same in, in, in school environments as well. So um, I think some of the factors that, 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 that seem to be associated with sustaining programs within um, settings such as early childhood are the professional... Um, regular professional learning opportunities for staff. So if staff can go along to regular in-services, fresh ideas, um, new approaches, that seems to motivate them to keep going with something. Um, I also think that... So, so I think that that's a, a, a key factor um, that I think I would, I would try and encourage with that. I think trying to also um, have... Um, the, the other key factor seems to be trying to reduce the, the ratio of, of staff to children within. And whilst that's not something that may be related to sustainability, so having, having students from TAFE or from university who come in and work regularly with staff can have that same sort of effect and can make staff um, aware of new ideas um, so it has a professional learning aspect, but it also reduces some of the, the pressure that they feel to have to come up with ideas um, the whole time. So I don't think there's a silver bullet to this, um, but I do think there's some of the things that, that, that we've worked with. I think having, you know, Munch and Move is good. It's a, it's a program that, that, that staff can take out with them, they can use, they've got the cards, etc. cetera. Um, so it's about, you know, how, how do we try and um, embed that into what we do day after day, week after week, month after month? And there's some of the things I think. There are a range of programs, so getting trained up in a, in a new evidence-based program can be helpful for that as well.